Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, what is the best future for Kaho'olawe? Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahalani Richardson, your host for tonight's show. 21 years ago, Kaho'olawe was returned to the state to be held in trust for the day that Native Hawaiians would create a federally recognized sovereign nation. That day has yet to come, but scores of volunteers have come to the 45 square mile island to replant, preserve, and perform cultural practices. During this time, more than $400 million has been spent on the removal of unexploded bombs and other military debris left behind from decades of military target practice. Today, the Island Reserve faces a limited future as funds are drying up. Tonight on Insights, what is the best future for Koho'olawe? We encourage viewers to join tonight's conversation by calling 973-1000 if you live on Oahu or 800-238-4847 if you're calling from a neighbor island. If you have a smartphone, tablet, or computer, you can watch Insights streamed live at pbs.org. Uh, pbshawaii.org. Just click onto the Insights logo or you can find us on Twitter at PBS Hawaii. Please use the PBS hashtag to make sure that we see your tweet. Now on to our panel. Daviana McGregor is the co-coordinator of the Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana, a nonprofit group that helps to steward the lands of Kaho'olawe. She also is an ethnic studies professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. John Waihe'e was Hawaii's governor when the military handed over control of Koho'olawe. Governor Waihe'e is the chairman of the Kana'i Olovalu, the Native Hawaiian Role Commission. Mike Naho'opi'i is the executive director of the Koho'olawe Island Reserve Commission. He's a former U.S. Navy officer who was in charge of Koho'olawe during the conveyance of the island to the state. And Ian Lind is a writer and political analyst. He was among the first people who occupied Koho'olawe in 1976 in an attempt to stop the U.S. Navy from using the island for target practice. Good evening to all of you and thanks for joining us tonight. Good evening. <laughs> Ms. McGregor, why don't I start off with you and can you explain the cultural significance of Koho'olawe to the Hawaiian people? Well, Koho'olawe, <clears throat> historically, uh, as our kupuna have told us, was named Kanaloa, and it was considered a body form and a center for Kanaloa, the god of the ocean. And um, it was a place that was used for training of our navigators, so that if you are traveling across the vastness of the Pacific Ocean, you really know, need to know intimately the nature and the characteristics of this this entity, this this force. And Hawaiians called that life force Kanaloa, and Koholawe was that place to go to learn about Kanaloa, to immerse yourself in Kanaloa. And as we've been working with the island, it, what's been revealed to us too is that it was a place that our ancestors used as a portal into other realms. Um, it's a place where the universe could be observed and a sun calendar developed and, and kept. So the many of the sites there are oriented to the universal time uh, that we observe seasonally. And so it's a very sacred place and I think um, this idea of sacred places began to emerge through our experience with Kanaloa and um, coming up with the uh, resurrection of the value and practice of Aloha Aina and recognizing that as Hawaiians we have a responsibility to really care for our, our natural resources and especially our sacred places. And Governor Waihe, the goal for Kaho'olawe is to return it to the Hawaiian people. Where do you see that happening? When is it possible? Well, I, I think that, uh, first of all, hopefully it's with the Hawaiian people now. Um, and, uh, and that we continue to respect the role that the Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana and that the Kaho'olawe Commission play as, as trustees for, for uh, Native Hawaiians and Native Hawaiian culture. But Kaho'olawe, because of its history, was also supposed to be one of the first places that was returned to the restored Hawaiian nation which I hope will happen in the very near future. Um, there's so much significance to the existence of the island. You know, it, it, it was the beginning. It was the place where uh, I, I, I remember where we started to deal with things that were sacred uh, as, as Native Hawaiians. 
And so, uh, you know, when, when we had a chance to do something about it, we said uh, this effort, there were too much sacrifice uh, that went on to get it. This effort need to be, needs to be recognized by, by being returned to the Hawaiian people, which should happen as soon as we can get uh, and have an election, get organized, mm -hmm. they're really easy stuff. And how does the status of the Native <laughs> Hawaiian role impact Kaho'olawe? Well, I think it, 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 it's, uh, it, it's a pathway. It's a pathway to having the island return back to the jurisdiction of the uh, of Native Hawaiians because what the, what the what the law says is that the Kaho'olawe would be held in trust by the state of Hawaii through its uh, Kaho'olawe Commission and through the work of the Ohana until it can be returned to a governing entity, a uh, governing entity that is recognized by the state, recognized by national government, recognized by, first of all, by Native Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. And so the, what the role is an attempt to do is to create that, is to create that entity and uh, not only take over um, well, Kaho'olawe would be the first of these places. Mr. Uh, Naho'opi'i, do you see the state ever being able to finally give it over to the, to the sovereign Hawaiian nation? Well, a lot of what you see today is you know, when we received the island from the federal government, the island was, 25% uh, of it was denuded of plants. Um, it was covered in unexploded ordnance. Uh, even after a 10-year period of cleanup by the Navy, uh, there's still about a quarter of the island that has been uncleared and a lot of areas that are not you know, usable for what we're doing today. Um, by statute, we will give the island, uh, well, we will transfer the island to the Native Hawaiian governing entity um, when the state of Hawaii recognizes and the federal government recognizes that entity, um, no matter what the conditions are. But the biggest thing that we're doing today is, as trustees managing the island, is to put it in a better condition than we received it, to try to prepare the place so that people could live on the island or could you know, uh, be uh, in a better status. And, and one of the stories I, I tell people is that it's like um, we're, we're preparing the table, we're going to set the dishes, make the food, and when, um, when the nation is recognized, then we're going to have the paina on the island. Get is it, it even <laughs> possible to have a, a viable community actually live on the island, given all of its destruction? I think in the last 20 years, we've really learned a lot of things of how to live on the island, especially with the Ohana. They've um, learned how to safely utilize the land we have. And that is the effort that we're trying to do today is there are a lot of areas there today that we can utilize for the purposes of traditional practice, for education, for restoration. Um, and we've developed a lot of techniques to do that. And we're on the forefront of the whole United States. You know, this is a bigger issue than just Kaho'olawe with regards to unexploded ordnance and these military lands. It's across the United States that all these military training areas are being returned to local governments. And we're leading the way on how to live on these areas and how to reuse these areas for other people across the United States. Mr. Lin, uh, take us back to that time in 76 uh, when you were on the island and, and the military was coming to arrest you. <laughs> well, we weren't there for very long. We probably got there uh, about, I don't know, 9 o'clock in the morning. Th those who were able to get through uh, past the Coast Guard helicopters that came in and announced to the boat owners, if you take your boat any farther, you risk it being you know, taken by the federal government. And fishermen in their boats kind of said, hey, I can't risk losing my boat. So most people turned back. And uh, there were a lucky few who got on uh, one boat who said, hey, I'm willing to go. And so... Uh, we were, you, were you in the first landing? Yes. Oh, fantastic. What and motivated you back then to do this? Well, back at that time, um, Kaho'olawe had been an issue mostly for, on Maui. Remember that uh, Mayor Carvalho's uh, pow pastor had a bomb dropped in it one day, and he was mad. Um, <laughs> Senator Inouye had done some work in Congress trying to uh, have, the, have the bombing stopped. Um, but at the, as the beginning of the American Bicentennial was approaching, uh, it was Charlie Maxwell on Maui who was going around, you know, we got to have some way to, to use the Bicentennial to show America what's really happening in Hawaii. 
And so I got a call. I'd been working with um, Kawaipuna Prajin, uh, who was founding the uh, Hawaiian Coalition of Native Claims, trying to piggyback on what was happening to uh, Native Americans on the mainland, uh, looking for reparations. And he got a call from Charlie Maxwell. He called me and said, hey, Charlie's getting people from all over the state to go to Kahoolawe. Okay, I'm in. <laughs> and you, know? you almost got this call, well, you got this call too, but you couldn't make it. I couldn't make it, but I was um, the chair at the time of the Ethnic Studies Program and now Department, and we were a center of activity on the campus. So I got the call, and I let other faculty members know, and some of them, I think, were able to go. I wasn't able, but he wanted to show that we weren't all happy Hawaiians sitting on the beach playing ukulele, dancing hula for the na tourists, but that we had serious issues of concern. We were the highest on the welfare rolls. We were the highest in prisons. And he said we needed uh, a, a wounded knee. We needed to do the kind of stand that the Native Americans had taken uh, in order to get attention to mm -hmm. the claims that he had a, a bill for reparations uh, in Congress that had been introduced by the ALOHA organization that he was president of. And ALOHA was an acronym for Aboriginal Lands of Hawaiian Ancestry. So Kaho'olawe and, and its issues around it, that, that actually wasn't the main focal point to Not begin it. with, mm -hmm. but it, it became a focal point for Native Hawaiians. Yes, because I think um, while Ian was taken off and others, there were two uh, who stayed behind, Noah Emmett Aluli and uh, Walter Ritty, and they, I think, had an epiphany on the island because while they witnessed this destruction, they also experienced a very deep spiritual presence. And when they returned to their island of Molokai, they went to their kupuna and they said, what, what is on Koholawe? Because we felt this very strong spiritual presence. And the kupuna began to open up to them that this island wasn't always Kolabi, wasn't always Bomb, it was Kanaloa, it was a very spiritual center for our ancestors. And then he, they went to Maui and talked with kupuna like Uncle Harry Mitchell in Hana, and then to Hawaii Island and Auntie Edith Kanaka'ole. And she would, told George Helm and uh, Emmett Aluli that they should organize an extended family for Kaho'olawe and take care of this island as a member of that family and not organize as an association or in a Western way, but really embrace this island in a very loving Hawaiian way. I don't, I don't think that most people re remember or recall what a significant uh, shift that was. Because up until that point in time, which was roughly around 19, 1975, and those of us who had been involved with the Hawaiian movement up to then were mainly concerned about socioeconomic issues. And that's what, mm -hmm. that's what it, things were looked at. It was a matter of, and a lot of the people who were involved in the Hawaiian movement actually came out of the war on poverty and improving your com community and the like. Mm -hmm. And then, we, so Kaholawe may have started as part of that momentum. But then something happened, something very dramatic happened with Kaho Olavi, because all of a sudden we discovered the spiritual dimension, mm -hmm. a spiritual dimension to the Hawaiian movement that really didn't exist before. We should say, you know, as we, the night before the, that first landing, um, people had flown in from all over the state, and we were all in a community center on Maui. and. People were up in small groups and larger groups talking story all night. And, you know, no one talked about Kaho'olawe. People talked about their issue with the Hawaiian Homes Commission on their island. They talked about um, their anti-poverty program and, and organizing in the housing. They talked about, you know, they were trying to work for jobs or they were trying to work on health care. And everybody was working on different things, trail access and access uh, to traditional hunting and fishing areas. Everybody in the state had different issues. We all ended up there on Kaho'olawe, and everybody, even though even those of us who just had a hint of Kaho'olawe, before that time, you know, you flew into island, they just said, oh, that's a bombing range. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a bombing, that's the smallest island, it's a bombing range. And we were all struck by, my God, it's a big island. You're in this little boat. It took you a long time to go around the island. It's something very different than what we'd been told. And so just that impact of, oh my God, we're bombing the heck out of 
a big piece of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. That, that's, that, I think, stopped everybody in their tracks. You know, we're already starting to get um, some questions from our viewers, and I wanted to ask you this, Mr. Naho'opi'i, and, you know, folks want to know, why has it taken so long? What can be done to speed up the process of the restoration? Well, one of the things you got to remember, it took almost 200 years. It was 200 years of devastation, and um, 200 years of goats uh, eating most of the vegetation on the island, the high winds around the area. A lot of things that's taking, making it difficult is we are a remote location. There's no infrastructure in the island. We have less than 18 inches of rain a year on the island. And um, we're starting from barren landscape. It's a great example, as, as we're talking about moving from social issues, we, in that same era, was the recognition of environmental concerns, preservation of the forest, the access to traditional gathering rights, and people are reconnecting with the forest and understanding what impacts that people and uh, society can have on our natural environment. Um, today, we are, we've never really had the funding to do all the programs we want to do on the island, and we try, a lot of our mission is focusing on volunteers, because we want the people of Hawaii to participate in this healing, because not only as they're healing the island, it's a transformative state that they heal themselves. And as a nation, they can learn from these things. And as, as um, I've, I've learned from uh, Dr. McGregor before, is Kahoalawe was the training grounds for a lot of the movements um, through the 70s and 80s. And people today are learning about those uh, past and also learning to become leaders in the in issues that are today. And a lot of the people that you see around today that are leading protests, they have spent time on Kahoalawe or they have um, gained a lot of knowledge from the ohana that's on the island and learning how to manage land. So the legislation. There were also two things though about Kahoalawe yeah. that we should keep in mind. Uh, first of all, when we were in the initial days, when we were working toward receiving the island, there was never an intention to get the island to the point where we could put skyscrapers on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really the intention and the future of the island was to have it uh, be as pristine as possible. So that, that affected the strategy regarding the cleanup. The second thing, though, which I think is really important and important for people to recognize is that even after the transfer of the island, it, the, the responsibility for cleaning up the Opala, the mess that was made, doesn't suddenly transfer over just to the to Native Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. the, the statute anticipated that that requirement uh, remains with the people, with the state of Hawaii and the federal government, the people who actually did that. In other words, you know, otherwise, why not give it to the Hawaiians? Take this violin and pass it over, save money. Well, we're not going to do that. <clears throat> and if other federal lands are returned, part of the negotiation, or the state lands, part of the negotiation ought to be, you know, yes, we need to have it back in the nation, but clean up the Opala. Mm -hmm. That's just a tip for anybody else who's thinking that lands ought to be returned. Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about the funding, uh, Mr. Naho'opi'i. Yeah. You got a million dollars, which sounds like a lot from the legislature, but that's not enough. Uh, yeah, our current budget, I mean, we've, we've cut for the last six or seven years, cut significantly down, and we're about, um, the funding we got this year from the legislature is about one third of what we need to continue operations. So we're making some very tough decisions um, in the next month of how are we gonna be able to continue some part of the restoration with this limited budget that we have. Um, we're very um, glad that we did get receive funding. It's the first time we've received funding from the state um, for any of the work on Kahoalawe. Uh, for the last 20 years, it's really been funded from a portion of the federal appropriation that Senator Noy gave uh, to the Navy, and then through the Navy to the state of Hawaii to take care of the island. And so now it, the state is stepping up and recognizing their kuleana with regard to Kahoalawe, and um, hopefully this is just the beginning. And as we go back to the next session in only eight months away, that they will make a decision to uh, increase our funding and see the great value of Kahoalawe, not just as a place to restore, but as its importance to people of the Hawaiian nation and for the rest of the people of the state of Hawaii. Uh, Dr. McGregor, how worried are you that these restoration efforts could stop because of a lack of funding? Well, um, 
I've been involved with um, Michael, the Protect mm -hmm. Labi Ohana, and the Kohlabi Island Reserve Commission um, staff and uh, commissioners and uh, someone from the Office of Mine Affairs working with the community in the last three years to develop a plan for the island that focuses on the island and not any one organization so that the island itself becomes the focal point for our restoration work and for our cultural learning activities um, and each of the organizations be it the Commission or the Ohana or Office of Foreign Affairs and other partners that we hope to join us um, will contribute to this overall operation. So it's a, it's a plan that goes through 2026, mm -hmm. which will be 50 years since the first landing. Mm -hmm. And we envisioned what is it that we want to accomplish for the island with the 50 years that we've been um, restoring it. And wh how can we accomplish that uh, bringing in together various partners from throughout the islands who want to contribute to the island's um, uh, well-being. And so the plan lays out a process to, it's, we call it Iola Kanaloa. Um, that's what we want to, uh, Kanaloa lives, because mm -hmm. the island, was, we're re recalling that original name for the island, and that uh, entity of Kanaloa who is um, a god also of deep ancestral memory that we will draw upon this deep ancestral knowledge to bring the best practices to the island for restoration and also to make it a center for learning. So I think the what we're trying to do is to is to have a partnership with many different cultural learning institutions um, to come in and support what and complement what the commission is doing so we just don't have a reliance upon that one source yeah. for the growth of the island. So you're not worried then that the, that the, the funds could someday dry up? Well, I think at the minimum, because it still is a, a very dangerous area because 23rd of the percent of the island hasn't been cleared at all, and really only 9% is cleared to a depth of four feet, it still is a danger. And so there's a minimum responsibility that the state has to provide to, to protect the general health and well-being of the general community to, to uh, not be affected by the impact of you know, the, the ordinance that's on the island. So the, the state has to provide some maintenance, some monitoring, some security, some enforcement. There's a lot that it has to minimally provide. And um, it's up to us, the community, to come in and provide their volunteer work to do the restoration. Mr. Lin, how have you seen the political climate surrounding Kaho'olawe change over the years and over the decades? Whoa. <clears throat> well, <laughs> um, that, that's, that's a tough one. Um, there were years of intensive um, protest um, shifting to uh, legal challenges to the continued bombing, um, to assert uh, environmental laws and a apply them to Kaolave. Um, as the as that intensity passed, and it, you kind of s saw the whole movement shifting gears into um, going to, into the long term, and you saw the Ohana developing um, not just. Uh, the persona as as protest, but as building and recreating these cultural roots that had been lost and and were now being um, uh, put back together pain, painstakingly over time, and the fact that I, I've just been in awe at their ability to overcome all the differences among the different groups who were involved and the different individuals and their perspectives, um, and to stay focused on the goal of of stopping the bombing and returning the island. You know, along the way there were fights over should you get involved in electoral politics or not? Should you be in should the Ohana or its or its constituent parts be endorsing candidates in the gubernatorial elections? Um, should be be opposed to or supporting Senator Inouye? Should you I mean on and on the, the divisions were there and yet um, the Corps persevered and, and remark, I mean, it's just remarkable to me that we've made it this far at this time. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Go right. Governor, do you see the, the, the passion over Kaho'olawe perhaps uh, falling, you know, next to or, you know, being overshadowed by other Hawaiian issues like 30 meter telescope and others? No, I think, I think that um, 
Well, I think that every generation should have its kaho alavi. And ours was kanaloa, it was that island. And uh, that, um, you know, and I think it, it was a very important experience for Native Hawaiians because it added the spiritual dimension to whatever we do. But I think it also demonstrated what Ian was talking about and that it is possible to unify around an ideal and, and you know, still have many, many different opinions, many, many strong people involved. And uh, to see that, you know, I, I remember we were, I was in the law school and we, we came out and my first criminal trial was defending a friend of mine who was arrested, uh, you know, Charlie War Warrington, and, and we, we, we came into courtroom and, I, and young lawyers and we, we practiced and we did everything and we were ready. You know, first graduates of the UH Law School with Hastings Law. This is our side of the, of the battle, you know, because we weren't, we weren't on the island at that time. And we went in there and we presented this case and we lost. And all of our friends went to jail, right? And then you see standing around and you're downstairs when the verdict is being read and we're all holding hands and singing and praying and you think this is insane. It's absolutely impossible. How are we going to beat the U.S. military, the whole U.S. government? And, you know, what you swear to yourself is that we're never going to give up. And then 1994, I'm standing on the beach and the deed is being handed over. And I say to myself, you know, this is fantastic. This is what Kaha'olavi did for us. So I don't think things get overshadowed. I think they build on them. Mm -hmm. Dr. McGregor, how, how do we get the current generation interested in Kaho Olave? Uh, because you have other issues. Let, let's go back to TMT. You have celebrities tweeting about it, putting you know pictures on Instagram, um, and that's the way the the younger generation looks at things these days. How do you see it for Kaho Olave? Well, I mean, actually, a lot of the people who are at the core of the um, protect. Mauna Kea movement or the Kukia'i Mauna Kea are Ohana members mm -hmm. and or have come to Koholave, have been inspired by mm -hmm. Koholave and by the the deep value of Aloha Aina and uh, they are they want to have it be their Kohola, the Koholave of their generation so it's very inspirational very very much support what's going on with the protectors of Mauna Kea and really um, bringing to this generation the whole lessons of, and importance of sacred and spiritual places. I'd like to acknowledge that one of the, 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 the important advisors, spiritual advisors to us on Koholawe and, and with Mauna Kea has been um, Pulani Kanaka'ole and the Kanaka'ole family and the Edith Kanaka'ole Foundation. And um, they have given us for the island a cultural plan called Kukulu Ke'ea Kanaloa you know, to become the pillars for this life of Kanaloa. And the cultural plan looks at the island as being this learning center where um, schools of Hawaiian learning f uh, can come and be in this place that's, you know, you're, you're away from the being being looked upon when you do cultural ceremony as being a performance mm -hmm. for, for a tourist activity or something, but you, you're really just doing it as Hawaiians and you're there in the moment and in the elements. And this cent this Kohlabi can serve as a center for these various schools of learning to really become masters in their field, you know, because you immerse yourself in these elements that we all are inspired for in our practice. So I think um, the younger generation is grasping that. This whole approach to the kukia i Mauna Kea of c having a kapu aloha is from uh, Luana Busby Neff and Pua Case. Luana is one of our founding members and, um, and has provided that kind of spiritual guidance in this, in this um, effort as well. Yeah. Well, tonight we're discussing the future of Koho Olave. Please call, email, or tweet your questions and comments. Call 973-1000 if you live on Oahu and 800-238-4847 if you're on a neighbor island. Now, fortunately, I, I had an opportunity to go to Kaho Olave for a volunteer project. And Mr. Naho'opii, one of the things that I was struck by was the 
the incredible beauty there next to the devastation. Yes. Can you give us an idea of what it's really like on the island as you drive around? Well, think, think about, well, a lot of times I tell people, think about, start with like an uh, area like uh, Waianae, very dry, uh, a lot of kiawe. Um, the thing you have to think about is with the goats that have been on the island, they ate all the vegetation, most of the vegetation on the island, and we're in the middle of this wind tunnel between Maui and Hawaii Island, and we normally have about 30 mile an hour winds on the island. So we've had these winds for years and years blowing the soil off the island because there's no longer plants to hold it down. So we have this sterile hard pan area that has no organic material, no nutrients, um, nothing growing on it. Um, one of the jokes we have is, I can probably park. I can probably plant better in the parking lot out out there because uh, at least asphalt has some uh, organic material in it. But um, it's very broad landscapes. It's a lot larger than people understand. Uh, a lot of people think of Kaholabi like Molokini. We're about ten times bigger, you know, maybe eleven times bigger than Molokini. It's a very large island and a very broad open landscape. No buildings. No lights. Um, and that's part of the beauty is its remoteness, its wildness, but also we see the opportunity to um, learn that if you do not protect an area, preserve an area, or let it go get fallow and abandoned, it will get to this area. It's almost like our Easter Island. It's our Rapa Nui, uh, the farthest end of ecological devastation. And it's up to us to try to bring it back at least so that it becomes a, a place where people could utilize it again. We would have our plants that we need. We would have food stock to be able to do it there. Um, so that, you know, that, that's kind of my view of what I see on Kaholave. There's the potential, a lot of potential out there. Mr. Lin, have you been back to no. Kaholave <laughs> since that, that day in 76? No. Why not? A good question. <laughs> um, at, uh, until the island was returned, I said I'd never go back uh, under military control. I still have my framed uh, letter banning me from Kaho'olawe forever by the uh, commandant of the 14th Naval District. <laughs> um, beyond that, uh, it's, a good, it's a pending question, open question. What surprised you about being there? Obviously, you had probably read about it in books, you've heard about it, but when you were actually there, just for those few hours, what really struck you? The size. Um, the fact that there was evidence all over that a lot of people were going there, hunters, fishermen, there were gold carcasses, you know, um, mm. butchered, butchered goats and um, uh, remains of other camping trips. Um, and I, I guess I still go back to the, the, the wild um, beauty of this large island that was so different from everything that you'd been told and had been, you know, was in all the tourist books, oh, that's just the speck of land they bomb. Yeah. And it, it was that, it was It the, looks like a speck on the map, but it, it takes a long They draw time. it as a speck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a speck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, that, and it was the, the juxtaposition of those things, the things you've heard all your life and now you're here in person and it's not the same thing. And that's an eye, that was a shocking eye-opener. You know, the, the other neat connection that's out there is, um, and we see this today, is you can go to a place out there and you know your ancestors were there because the evidence of the tools they worked on, the things that they made, are still sitting on the ground open. Right. You would not see that yeah. anywhere else in Hawaii. <coughs> They've Except all been maybe on Monokia. Mono yeah. There's yeah. some of that on yeah. Yeah. So people, yeah. uh, let's before the goats, yeah. Native Hawaiians. Na there was a Native Hawaiian population there on the island. Based on the, what the archaeologist studies have shown, they estimate maybe an 800 people population on the island, and a very. It's only seven miles from Maui, so it's a very close connection of fishing, going back and forth between Maui Island itself and people going. To to the island to fish and have villages along the island. And there's evidence of, of religious sites, um, worship, also house sites. Um, and a lot of those things are just there. They're as they were, as people stood up and walked away and left mm -hmm. hundreds of years ago. And we can come back and we can see our ancestors, how they lived and how they uh, conducted their lives and how they survived on a remote island. And it's all there today. You know, yeah. the, the, the whole, the, the, it's such, there was such a history there. But there was such a history in the movement. I, I was talking to you about the first landing because uh, Steve Morris was mm -hmm. with you. Yeah. And, he, and he wrote this, this 
novel, this book, and what's and uh, it's a it's his first draft thing. Have you? Well, anyway, I, I've read it, and it, uh, the thing about it that struck me was the human interaction. I mean, I, w I was laughing the entire time. I mean, you, you guys actually had fun. <laughs> you, know, you guys actually had fun. You were on the island the first time discovering all these things. And today we're talking about it so seriously. Yeah. But you actually had fun. I mean, you had that guy who came whipping out of nowhere that you never see again, <laughs> threw you in the boat and took you there. And then you had the two kupuna who you had to push up on the, you know, <laughs> literally hold over your head as you climbed on the Coast Guard cutter. You should say, all of that Steve stuff. Steve Morse's book is available on Amazon.com. <laughs> is it really? Yes. Is it really? I, I have a copy. I, I just, I, it's at the mail. But, but it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, one of the most poignant, most beautiful time of my life was being in McKenna the night before they went out again and hearing George Helm sing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember, we had that, that luau. People brought food in. We were all mm -hmm. sitting around. And George, George was singing, and he never sang better ever. <laughs> and it was so beautiful. I mean, it, 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 these things were poignant. They were serious. But it was fun. It was yeah. a good thing to be a part of. You know, we have a question from Mike from Hawaii Kai, and he wants to know, can volunteers realistically restore the island? Do you think so? Yeah, I believe so. I think um, it's families and communities, um, students and teachers ha who have been actually providing a large part of the, the, the work on the island to restore it. And that's really um, the way in which the island will be restored in the future uh, through everyone coming and uh, contributing their their love and and labor to the island and in the process people have this transformative yep. experience mm -hmm. that they are healed in healing the island we become healed and it really isn't going to take you know I think it would be almost dangerous to try to do it on a mass scale with large machines and all that you really have to approach this with a very loving manner because at the same time there are all these cultural sites everywhere so when, as you're beginning the restoration of the island you also have to be very conscious you have to ask permission you have to do it in a very loving way mm -hmm. and with a purpose you know every time we go into a new area we acknowledge the spirits of that place we ask permission to come and the work that we do is to really begin to bring it back to life. What's a specific example of, of one of the cultural sites that's really touched your heart? Well, there's a place up in the top of the island, and it's a pohaku, a stone called Pokane Loa. And um, it's the only kind of, it's the only, it's, this, it's unique throughout the islands. No, it's, no other rock like this has ever been found. And it's, oriented to observe the rising of the sun. And as the sun rises, if you put a, a, a pole at one, the eastern side, there are these poho, these cupolas, and the, the sun casts a sh the, the shadow of the pole is in each of these pukas. And it's, um, it, it just reaffirms how our ancestors used kaholave as, and, and understood kaholave was this portal to really understand this larger universal time and um, it's teetering on the edge of a, of a um, uh, culch and we're concerned that we might lose it. So we, we're doing a project to try to stabilize the area, if necessary, move it in, so that we can stabilize it better. But the Pohaku is uh, a place, you know, it's Kane Loa means the place where the morning sun, that's the realm of Kane, meets the, the, the afternoon sun of Kanaloa. And Kane Loa on Koholawe and other places are named for Kane Loa, are these places where these two realms come together and you can observe, uh, you know, the, these um, phenomenon. So that is a really important site. It, near to it are these fabulous petroglyphs, and the rock itself has petroglyphs on it that we still have to understand and decode. And so it's a, it's a challenge to us to understand it, to reconstruct what our ancestors envisioned there, uh, but also to save this pohaku for future generations. Mr. Naho'opi'i, what's your, your thought on actually creating some sort of a, uh, you know, like e ecotourism there to, to, to help your money situation? 
Well, you know, one of the things that we were looking at as, as part of uh, this EOLA common law plan is our next phase um, is to look at the business model of, of how do we fund these projects that we want to do in the next 12 years. And you know, one of the options that is coming up on the table or it was introduced by the legislature this year on some of our bills was the idea of revenue generation um, and creating some mechanisms. So we're not looking at tourism and commercialization on the island, because there's always been the fear that commercial equals development, which equals devastation. We're looking at ways of creating revenue to support the activities that we're doing on the island that are in that are consistent with the projects that we're developing under Iola Kana Law. So um, it it's something that is going to be discussed probably in the next six months. Um, one of the things that we owe to the legislature come fall before the next session is to generate a self-sustaining, uh, uh, a self-sustaining financial plan um, that we have to turn into the legislature to explain how there are opportunities in the future of continuing the work on the island. So is perhaps one of the ideas to actually have people pay to come to Kaho Olave to help finance the well, that, restorations there? It, it's an idea like um, if you're going to go to the university and you're going to take a class and learn something, you would pay tuition. It's a similar idea that um, to, pair, to, to help uh, share the costs of what it takes to do things on the island and help share the costs of learning and studying and to be part of contribution to it. So, you know, it's not just um, I'm going to go and take, but I'm going to go help and share and to, um, and to contribute to the, the operation of the island. Yeah. Would you support something like that, Mr. Lin? Definitely. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people uh, we know whose children, whose grandchildren, have been there who come back and and they have a whole different view of things and it and, you know it's it's um it's an ongoing cultural education um, center that's that's already having a huge effect as you say yeah. generations now of young activists are coming a, and um, performers and students are coming out of this yeah. um, with a new appreciation of where they live and who they are. Governor, how do you think that the, the protest of Koho Olave back in the 70s really influenced uh, the Hawaiian movement today? Well, I think the, I think the, the most the critical, I mean, the most, it was a critical turning point because it added a spiritual dimension, as I said, to our entire movement that really uh, didn't exist before. Much of what happened in the 78 Con Con uh, Constitutional Convention was based on Kaho Olabi, uh, based on all of the movements uh, of that time. It really came all together with the Aloha movement and, and the rest. Um, one of the things, though, you know, I, I don't know about how the fundraising and so forth would be. Um, how that should be handled, and I, and I really leave that to people who are right on the ground. But I, I think that we, we, we shouldn't, the state shouldn't think for a second, and neither should the federal government, that they somehow transfer responsibility for what they have done mm -hmm. along with the title. You know, this, this is not a quick way to get rid of your problems, give it to Native Hawaiians. You know, I mean, if the Native Hawaiians are going to get uh, Kahualavi back, the cleanup was part of the deal. Uh, and, and, and if Mauna Kea in the future may get into Native Hawaiian hands, then the Opala has to be cleaned up. Uh, so yes, we should do whatever we can to pull up our own boots, bootstraps and all of that. But one of the things about the movement was I think we shouldn't forget that there was uh, some responsibility uh, for the people who put, who made, who created the problem in the first place. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, you may uh, talked about several. Well, of the see, I don't have to be nice to the legislature. That's <laughs> what I mean. These guys have to go there next year and go and lobby again. You know, so I'm telling the legislature, hey, you know, come on. You know, one. I mean, yeah. Great job, we got some money. But that was one third of what we needed. Yeah. You guys have a responsibility to do this. And uh, the state of Hawaii, you know, 
hey, we'll, we'll, obviously we're in support of science and the rest of this stuff, blah, 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 but what about treating things with respect? What about the federal funding? What's happened to that? Well, um, you know, a lot of the federal funding was really hinged upon um, Senator Noy. He was one of our greatest champions of getting the island return, getting the funding. And you know, the, what, what the question I asked him while he was still around was, how did you come up with $400 million? And it was, that was as much as he could get, you know, using his influence um, that he was willing to utilize at that time. And we knew that $400 million was not enough to clean up the island. Um, we understood that at the very beginning. Well, he understood that at the very beginning. And you know, one of the things we have to remember is that the federal obligation has not ended. Just that program of that cleanup has been completed. The obligation under the law that Senator Noy passed, but the long-term federal obligation is still there. And cleanup can still continue tomorrow. Um, so for us, we're, we've been in conversations with our current um, uh, congressional delegation. Um, a lot of them are brand new, and they're getting their feet wet, and they're really getting in uh, there, and they've shown a lot of love for the island. Um, now it's trying to figure out how they can utilize that their new positions and their and their statute to try to create things for us. In well, the we were in the. We, I was. We were. I was in yeah. the discussion yeah. on how much funding for the island and how we could get. Uh, that was when we were in office. And the actual obligation that the federal government had to for the cleanup was something more like two, uh, two, uh, over two billion dollars. See, and then from there we went down to 400 million as part of the discussion. Be and that was based on uh, the, the most important factor was that the people, the Ohana and others that were involved with the island, realized that for two billion dollars, we were talking about a cleanup that would restore the island to the place where you could build, you could essentially build hotels and stuff. Hotels like that. Yeah. on it. Is that? Yeah. It, let's say and you so, could pick a figure. Would it be two million dollars? How much you would need we're to complete? We're talking billion. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, billion dollars. Yeah, billion, and yeah. four hundred million was the number that was settled on to get it clean to yeah. the place where essentially we can start to Doing work something. on it. Yeah. But the, something, yeah. the agreement was the federal government would clean 30% of the island to a depth of four feet, yep. and they've only cleaned 9%. Yep. Yes, they I'm were saying. supposed to clear 100% of the surface, and they only cleared 75 percent. Yeah. So there's like 25% of the island, 23% that's not been cleared at all, yep. and they haven't fulfilled their obligations. Yes. So there's and a foundation even if there. The land go, even if the island is returned to a native governing organization, their obligations right. still exist. Yep. Yes. Yep. So the who's the champion thing. for Hawaii in Congress now, politically? I think all of our... All of them, all yeah. All of them. <laughs> so we just have to, I think they have all uh, yeah. expressed interest in... Yeah. in mm -hmm. Helping to do something. And we'll ask him in front of a mic, too. <laughs> <laughs> we should explain. I'll have the governor ask him in front of the mic. <laughs> For viewers who don't know, that the, the basis of all this is in the uh, executive orders which took this land and yep. set it aside for military oh, yes. use, in which the federal government said, it, they wrote the thing, they wrote these executive orders and they said, and when we return it, we'll put it back in the condition that it was when we got it. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Safe for human habitation. So all, human so all habitation. of the, you know, the costs and everything else goes back to the commitments that were made and legally binding commitments in those executive orders. Yeah. Uh, Dr. McGregor, I mean, it, it, it looks like, let's say, absolute pristine land would not be possible, at least in the near future. Mm -hmm. But if, if Koho'olawe were to be fully returned to the sovereign nation, what, what would Hawaiians do there? Well, as I said, we have the, the plan that was given to us by the Edith Kanaka Oli Foundation for the island to be elevated again and recognized as a central uh, and sacred pico of our islands, that it would be a center for cultural learning and mastery of Hawaiian learning arts. And as you as you go there, you, you also engage in the restoration of the island. So it, it, it would be this amazing cultural center that um, everyone, Hawaiian and non-Hawaiian alike, could go to to learn uh, about Hawaiian culture very, from very deep knowledge to mastery and at all different levels to experience that. You know, I wanted to talk about a little bit about the funding challenge because 
in order for the island to continue to be sacred, as a sacred place, it does need to still have that commercial ban. There's a ban now that commercial use of the island is prohibited. And that has to remain in place for the island to continue to remain distinct and sacred. So whatever um, we, revenue that needs to be generated has to be generated on Maui for the island, or it has to be revenue that doesn't uh, violate this commercial prohibition. And that's the challenge to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Another thing is so that... So you wouldn't support, let's say, like a, a small ecotourism type oh, of group coming not. over? Oh, absolutely not. No, Arohana yeah. would definitely... Yeah, and we're not looking uh, at <laughs> tourism kind of th activities. Mm -hmm. We would have to occupy yeah. again to oppose yeah, that. <laughs> the thing you remember that the island is set aside for very specific use. It's yeah. set aside for traditional Native Hawaiian practices, education, restoration, and preservation of its resources. But there is a cost for those to right. be able to support those type of activities on the island. And that's what we're looking at is um, to people to understand that it's not just free to go and do things on the island, but there is a core infrastructure that needs to help make sure right. that the people are safe. We have radios, communication, so that people, if there's injury, we have people who can respond to the injuries, that um, the trails are swept and cleared. Um, even, um, uh, we work very closely with the Ohana to train their longtime um, volunteers to be able to identify unexploded ordnance and safety procedures. So there's, there's a core infrastructure that needs to be provided for the island to make sure that people are safe and that they can uh, do these things that were allowed on the island. When was the last accident on the island? Uh, most of the thing, most people get injured from slip, slips and falls, twist ankles, you know, those kind of things um, on the island. Um, Kiabi poke, <laughs> you know, we have a lot of kiabi, yeah. uh, those kind of items. The only yeah. ordinance related was when, during the cleanup, someone got injured, but there's yeah, not the, been any uh, ordinance not, related. Yeah, the, the, we did have a couple of um, accidents on the cleanup, but it, they were more related to the industrial side of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a helicopter mm -hmm. accident, right. um, um, use of different tools and stuff, but no mm -hmm. one's been, we had some un an unintentional detonation of ordinance, but nobody was injured from those. and. Um, I think the last actual person I saw injured by ordnance was actually during my time in the military, and it was a couple of the young sailors out there playing around with um, 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 bullets and making a little pipe bomb thing, you know, young guys and remoteness. Yeah, and they have too much training with weapons. So, <laughs> so if we look at the island where we, uh, the Ohana has, has out since our first landing, has focused on Haki, what we call Hakuaba, which is the center where people yeah. live, and there's house sites, cultural sites, sacred um, shrines and, and heiau and such. And then on the west side is where the Navy had its encampment, and the Kirk has, uh, the Kohlhaapi Island Reserve Commission uses it as their base of operations, which is where if we were to have kupuna come and train, you know, extended training workshops, yeah. that would be there. And right now, it's um, oil, you know, it's, Fossil fuel based, and yeah. so one of the one of the things that would greatly reduce the cost about maybe eight hundred thousand dollars. I'm not sure about, but about a million dollars is spent on infrastructure, yeah. and so one of our our goals is to transfer the island off of fossil fuel for um, uh, what needs what the needs are for the island, and also for transportation to and from the island, mm -hmm. and also on the island. So if we can have Kohlavi become a model of self-sufficiency, yep. uh, totally off fossil fuels. Yep. That would uh, reduce the cost of running the island, operating the island, and it would also be a model for self-sufficiency yep. and sustainability on Pacific Islands. So that's one of yep. our goals by 2026, is to you know do this transition yep. off of fossil fuels. And that's something that the legislature has identified, and they have provided us the support for that. Uh, especially through uh, Senator Kalani English and the late um, Representative Melly Carroll, they had sponsored um, CI, uh, capital improvement funding. So we, and the governor has released um, about two and a half million dollars for alternative energy programs on Kahoolawe that we'll be implementing in the next two years. And our goal, you know, there, there's the there's a state goal of fossil fuel free, and to be 100%, uh, um, I think it's 100% sustainable uh, energy by 2046. I think it'll look at the dates. We hope Kahoolawe will be the first island in the state that will be fossil fuel free. I think that though, when we when we anticipated and we we looked at the language of returning the island to the Native Hawaiian 
governing en entity, it really wasn't in the, in the um, sort of the, the Western sense. And I mean, yes, it, would, it was about title, but it wasn't like a place to be used for uh, development or anything. It was sort of like returning the heart mm -hmm. of the nation. Mm -hmm. So it was never anticipated to be more than what it could be as a cultural center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Yeah. Lind, really quickly, are, are you satisfied with the progress so far? I'm amazed by the progress so far. <laughs> uh, one last question. Uh, should Kaho'olawe be renamed Kanaloa? Dr. McGregor? Oh, we already are renaming it and using that in all of our work, yeah. Yola Kanaloa. And we, we, um, we want to uh, you know, have that recognition of the island as Kanaloa as a sacred center, and that would help, I think, make that you know association for everyone in the islands. And then, in terms of uh, officially, uh, when when would you see that happening? Well, it's a process. The, all, all <laughs> <takes is built>. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's um, you know, Koholab is also a traditional name. Yeah. It's not something that was made up either. I mean, it's in it's in the origin chants. The the chants would speak of Papa giving birth to the islands. She gave birth to Koholabe as well. And so, you, you know, we have many names. This is we as as you know, people have different names, and and all of them have different levels of yeah. meaning and importance. And it's and it's so interesting. And I wanted to thank you so much for all of your time tonight on this really amazing topic. Thank you so much for talking thank you. about this. Well, the rail tax and medical marijuana dispensaries were issues debated in this year's legislative session. As lawmakers wind down, which initiatives passed and which ones didn't? What did our lawmakers do this session to make Hawaii better? That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahia Lani Richardson. Ahoy ho.